Today on Know the Truth, from Philip de Corsi. When you know something's about to happen, and that thing is important, you're going to get yourself ready for it. You're not going to leave it till the last minute to be ready. In fact, this is something Jesus warns us not to do, right? That we need to be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. Are you making yourself ready for Jesus' coming? For some of us, it's tough to get ready for church on Sunday, let alone get ready for eternity. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, Senior Pastor of Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills, California. Today's message reminds us that Jesus is coming back and we need to get ready and stay ready. Philip explains just how to do that as he opens to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Our current study is titled Classic Christianity, and we're discovering how to live with joyful expectations. W.P. Nicholson was an Irish evangelist at the turn of the 20th century that God used to win thousands to Christ, both in his native Northern Ireland and around the world. In fact, he was so used of God that if you were to visit Harlan and Wolf shipbuilders today, you'll find a shed entitled the Nicholson Shed. Because during his revivals, during his evangelistic campaigns, So many men got saved in the city of Belfast that worked in the shipyard, and they took back all the stuff they had stolen. They had to build a shed to house it all. And it was ever called the Nicholson Shed. In his meetings, he looked for repentance on the part of the unbeliever. In his meetings, he looked for holiness on the part of the believer. He was filled with the Spirit of God. That was without doubt. He was plain spoken. He was even vulgar and unorthodox in his ways. An example of this would be when he was in Scotland doing an evangelistic campaign. He wasn't seeing much response. And so one morning at 2 a.m., he runs through this little village ringing a bell and shouting, fire, fire, fire. Windows fling open, doors swing open. People follow him down to the middle of the village shouting, where's the fire? Where's the fire? To which Nicholson replies, it's in hell. And if you don't get saved and come to my meetings, that's where you're going. He was rather unorthodox, even even vulgar, but he was used of God. And just this past week, I was reading of his conversion. It was a Monday morning. He had been a merchant seaman. He had come home to live with his mother in Bangor and County Down. He was sitting at the table reading his morning paper, smoking. His mom was cooking breakfast. He knew the gospel, but as of yet, he hadn't responded. But sitting there, a voice seems to cry out to him, Now or never, Nicholson. Now or never, Nicholson. You must decide for or reject Jesus Christ. According to him, a sweat broke out on his brow. He began to tremble with fear. And there, sitting at that kitchen table in his mother's parlor, he bows the knee in repentance and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he turns to his mother, who's turning the eggs in the frying pan, and says, Mother, I I got saved. And she says, When? He said, just now, where? Just at the table. And according to him, she cries with joy unspeakable. She couldn't say a word, but just hugged me and cried. Her baby boy had not only come home from the sea, but was now saved. Listen to these words by Nicholson. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. It was Monday, 8.30 a.m., The 22nd of May, 1899, what a day. And then he says this, this is striking, a day that will never see an end. I love that sentence. What a truth, what a thought. That when you and I come to Jesus Christ, 
It is a day that will never see an end. Trusting Christ is only the beginning of something that will last forever. You see this in the writings of Paul. Paul was always looking forward. He uses metaphors such as first fruits, birth pangs, the deposit of the Holy Spirit to make it clear that whatever we experience of Christ now, whatever we enjoy of Christ now, it's only the installment of something far vaster and greater to come. Proverbs 4 verse 18 tells us that the path of the just is as a light that grows brighter and brighter until that perfect day. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says when Jesus gets a hold of us, he changes us from glory to glory to glory. When you and I come to Christ at a given moment, at a given hour, on a given day, that's a day that will never see an end. And that helps explain why Paul never takes his eye off the distant horizon of the end time in his letters. That explains his fervor in this letter to a young church to teach them the doctrine of the second coming. We saw indeed that this was an excellent church, an elect church, an exemplary church, and an evangelistic church. But lastly, we saw it was an expectant church. This was a church that lived on the tiptoes of expectancy. They heard the tick-tock of the prophetic clock as it moved incessantly towards that midnight hour when Jesus would come for His people. Look at what we read. They turned to God from idols to serve the true and the living God and to wait for His Son from heaven. These two infinitives describe the result of their repentance. They turned to Jesus Christ and they began serving Him and waiting for Him. We started to look at their anticipation. There's three things I want to see under this heading of the expectant church. Paul taught the doctrine of Jesus' return. And as we look at that doctrine, I want us to see its anticipation, its articulation, and its application. This was a church who were waiting up, love that, waiting up for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were keeping vigil for the soon return of the Savior. And we saw that this was an engaging picture. It was an exciting picture. It's the picture of someone keeping vigil at the bedside of a sick or dying family member. It's a picture of a mother or father staying up to midnight waiting for their child to return. This was a body of believers who were waiting up for Jesus to return from heaven. The very heavens that received him would someday give him back up again and he would come to receive his people. Now, we could leave it there, but I was thinking about this. What does that look like, okay? What does that look like in your life and my life? What might have it looked like in their life, this waiting up, this anticipation, this eager expectation for Jesus to come back? Well, on the one hand, I think living in the light of Jesus' imminent return will produce a certain readiness. When you know something's about to happen, and that thing is important, you're going to get yourself ready for it. You're not going to leave it till the last minute to be ready. In fact, this is something Jesus warns us not to do, right? In the parable of the ten virgins, over in Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13, Jesus tells a story of a bridal party that had gone out to meet the bridegroom, but the bridegroom had delayed And sometimes in the Jewish culture, the wedding procession headed up by the bridegroom would come even at night time. And so those who were part of the bridal party would have their lamps lit, waiting for the bridegroom. They'd go out to meet the bridegroom to bring him to his bride. But Jesus says of those ten virgins, five of them were ready and five of them weren't. And Jesus reminds us that we need to be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. We need to order our lives so that on any given day our bags are packed and we're ready to leave and to be with Christ should that be His will and should that be His desire and His design. In fact, the word for Jesus coming here in 1 Thessalonians is a word perusia. 
It actually speaks of the coming of a king or a dignitary or an important person to a city and how that city would get itself ready. The streets would be swept. The buildings would be painted. In fact, new buildings would often be built. Coins would be minted in honor of the king who was coming, the emperor who was visiting. That's our word. And when Jesus comes to call us home, we need to be ready. Before I went into the ministry, I worked at an aerospace company called Shorts in Belfast. And on a number of occasions, we won the Queen's Award for Industry. And often that, that entailed a royal visit. When I was in the company, we were actually visited by Prince Philip, the husband to Queen Elizabeth. And I can tell you, the floors were polished. Walls were painted. We got a lesson in how to speak to royalty and make sure our P's and Q's were all in a line should Prince Philip talk to us. We were given a new set of overalls for the day. It was taken back off us the next day. It was all there to show the prince the best that can be for shorts. That's our word. Are you making yourself ready for Jesus' coming? Are you ready in your family? Are you keeping short accounts with those you may have issues with? Are you dealing with your life on a daily basis in the light of the parousia, the coming of Christ? But there's a second way in which I think this works itself out. Your life and my life ought to be marked not only by readiness, but by restlessness. See, when you know someone's coming or you know something's happening, you'll not only get ready for it, you'll be restless for it to happen, especially if it's a good thing, especially if it's something you want. I mean, we all, we've either seen it as parents or we've all experienced it as children. It's the Christmas Eve syndrome, you know? They're going to stay up all night because someone's coming and tomorrow there's going to be presents to open and things to enjoy. And there's this restlessness with a kid that starts about mid-afternoon on Christmas Eve. It's the same thing, isn't it? The last day of school, summer recess, you know, as the teacher drones on in front of the blackboard and you're saying, give it up and let's get out of here. (laughs) Summer's here. There's this restlessness. It's hard to do your homework, isn't it? Hard that final week to get those projects in when you know just in a few days it's summer. It's off to the beach. It's spending the summer with your pals. I think something of that should be going on in your life and my life when it comes to the second coming of Jesus, don't you? Not only should we be ready, we should be restless. There should be a nervous energy about us. There should be an excitement about us. Now, we've got to control that. We've got to control that. You do need to finish your homework and finish strong the last week of the semester. You know what? There's still things that have to be accomplished on Christmas Eve. Chores to be done around the home. Now, you and I need to control our expectation, lest it makes us irresponsible. In fact, when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15, it seems that there were some at this church who had become stir-crazy about the second coming, so much so that they had detached themselves from ordinary life. Some of the men had given up their jobs, it might seem. They had become lazy. And Paul has to remind them, hey, you've got to live quiet and peaceable lives. You've got to bring the bacon home. You've got to take care of your family. The second coming of Jesus doesn't make us irrational or it doesn't make us impractical. So on the one hand, we got to control our excitement lest it becomes a fanaticism, lest we become, you know, detached from our responsibilities both within the church and towards the culture. But on the other hand, we don't want to lose that excitement. It's got to be held in tension. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. There's a crown for those who love His appearing. This is exciting. Jesus is going to come someday and take us home. We're going to be with Him forever. The day I put my faith in Jesus Christ, the age of 16, in a street in Belfast, that was a day, along with William Nicholson, where I came to understand it was a day that would never see an end. I mean, it's a good life. I was talking to a man visiting us from Europe. He doesn't believe. Very nice man. 
He admitted he was an atheist, a scientist by nature. And he said, you know what? But I do envy you Christians. You do have a good time. You have hope. You've got confidence. I felt like saying, hey, buddy, you haven't seen the half of it. This is only a start. This is a day that will never end. And it just gets brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger and better and better. It's hard not to be excited about this, isn't it? See, love makes us restless. Some things we got to do but there's some things we love to do. And the Bible says we ought to love His appearing, not just believe it, not just wrestle with the text to understand it, but actually love it. Love makes you restless, doesn't it? If you love a sport or you love a person, when you're away from the thing you love, you're just itching to be somewhere else. You know, if you love golf, then you want to be on a golf course. If you're in the company of other people, but you love someone special, you'd rather be with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife. Although you're somewhere, you'd rather be somewhere else. That's what love does. It makes you restless. I think that's a little bit of that John 17 thing. We're in the world, and we got to do our job while we're here. We got to live quiet and peaceable lives, make an impact for Christ. We got to do our daily duties like everybody else. We're in it, but we're not off it. We're here, but to be quite honest, we'd rather be somewhere else. Paul shows us this tension, doesn't he, in Philippians 1, where he's, it's possible he might lose his life. It's his first imprisonment. He writes to the Philippians who are concerned about him. He says, look, maybe your prayers will result in my delivery. But he says, I want you to be honest. Don't be thinking I'm, you know, biting my nails and ruining the day I'm in prison. He says, look, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To be quite honest, if I had a choice, I'd rather be with Christ. Because you see, if you live for Christ, what does death do? It brings you into a deeper experience of Christ. (laughs) So death for the Christian who's madly in love with Christ, death's not something to run from. The worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that can happen to you. Just more Christ. And yet Paul says, I want to be with him. I'm here, but I want to be there. But he does acknowledge, and this is where the tension is, it doesn't make him reckless. He says, look, if I have to stay, then I'm going to serve you. But I'm just telling you, if I had my choice, it's the same thing. You got to go to work tomorrow, and you should go and do a good day's work and serve the Lord through your company. You got to raise your children. You got to do those menial, mundane things that are part of life. We're here, but to be quite honest, we'd rather be somewhere else, wouldn't we? See, love does that. Love makes you restless. And if that's true, one would assume that these believers at Thessalonica were not only marked by a readiness, they were marked by a restlessness. They were never really at home in the world. Let me make a start on a second thought. We've looked at its anticipation, and this will spill over into the next time we're together. I want you to see it's articulation. It's articulation. This is the first mention of a series of mentions in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians regarding the second coming. So this was a doctrine that Paul preached. This was a truth that Paul taught. We called these letters the eschatological letters, didn't we? Because as Dick Mayhew pointed out in his helpful commentary in First and Second Thessalonians, that one third of these two letters are prophetic in nature. That's striking. Forty-two of one hundred and thirty-six verses point us to the horizon and to the possible return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Parousia, the King is coming. Our Master is coming, and we need to be ready for His return. This church had been taught that they were to get up every day believing that they could be caught up any day. You may want to write that little statement down and think about it this week. Every day we get up, we should think about the fact that someday we're going to be caught up. And are we living in the light of that reality? It seems to me that for pastors today, for churches today, they might get around to thinking about the second coming eventually. That's not Paul's 
paradigm, and that's certainly not the case with this church. They didn't get around to thinking about the second coming. They were thinking about it all the time. And that's what makes this letter important. There are three things about this letter that show its importance. Number one, it's one of the earliest of Paul's 13 letters. It may be second only to Galatians. That's significant. Number two, it affords us a clear picture of Paul's ministry model and of the life in the early church. That's why this is significant. Paul, through these letters, opens a door. We walk through it, and we're right at the epicenter of New Testament Christianity. This is the infant church. This is primitive Christianity. And number three, it underscores, given those facts, the importance attached to the doctrine of the second coming. Today it's being relegated. Today it's being marginalized. But here we have an apostolic paradigm. Paul, the evangelist, the church planter, he was in that city maybe a few weeks, certainly no more than a few months. And by the time he left, they were living in expectancy with regards to the second coming. When they came to Jesus Christ, when they turned from their idols to God, Paul immediately said, hey, this is a day that will never end. Now, let me tell you what you've got to look forward to. Jesus has not only saved you from the penalty of your sin, that's called justification. Jesus is saving you from the dominion of sin, that's called sanctification. And someday, he's going to come back and take you home, that's called glorification. When you're not only going to be saved from the power of sin and from the penalty of sin, you're actually going to be saved from the presence of sin. And no wonder then they're sitting up. They're pulling back the curtains every morning saying, Maranatha, the Lord comes. Oh, they prayed the sinner's prayer, but they had no sooner prayed that prayer than Paul had them praying another prayer, even so come, Lord Jesus. Because you see, there's two sides to our salvation. There's when we receive Christ, that's at the beginning, and then there's going to come a day when Christ receives us, that's at the end. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go away, I'm going to come back and listen, what? Receive you unto myself. Those who have received Christ, Christ will receive. An important word from Philip DeCourcy today on Know the Truth. It's part six of his message titled, The Real Deal. We're nearing the end of a series in 1 Thessalonians called Classic Christianity, And in case you'd like to go back and hear this series from the beginning, it's not too late. You can download audio messages for free or purchase the entire study on CD when you visit ktt.org. Well, how you doing on those New Year's resolutions? Here at Know the Truth, we'd like to help you resolve to grow stronger spiritually, so we're offering an excellent book to guide you along this process. The Strength You Need, The Twelve Great Strength Passages of the Bible by author Robert J. Morgan, presents God's Word alongside inspiring commentary, all designed to boost your strength and confidence in God. Ask for the strength you need when you make a generous donation to know the truth. You can also receive this book when you become one of our monthly Truth Ambassadors. What's more, when you sign up to give a monthly recurring gift for the first time, we'll send you the custom Know the Truth mug, created just for our newest partners. Get your monthly giving started when you visit us online at ktt.org. Or let one of our friendly volunteers assist you when you call 888-644-8811. And if you're new to Know the Truth, we'd like to welcome you with an absolutely free resource. Just for the Classic Christianity series, we've created the Model Church Study Bookmark, highlighting the biblical characteristics of a healthy, God-centered church. Ask for the Model Church Bookmark today when you reach out by phone to 888-644-8811. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you back tomorrow when Philip DeCourcy continues teaching about the real deal. Don't miss Tuesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.